tonight, fair play or false start? Basically what Caster is being told is that she's too strong to be a real woman. A champion runner pays the price for a natural advantage. How a new decision splits the track world. 95% of our driving, if not 98, is within an hour, which would be perfect for an electric vehicle. Ottawa pays to encourage green driving. We'll look at some concerns money can't solve. Suddenly, her face swelled up. So we didn't know at the time what it was. And the next thing to worry about in food allergy, not peanuts, but pea protein. It's popular, but it's not for everyone. This is The National. We need to begin with some crushing disappointment today for thousands who live along the Ottawa River. They had been told floodwaters were about to peak, and then this morning, forecasters called for more rain, meaning weary homeowners have to wait another day or two to see if the defences will hold. I just hope it starts going down soon. Well, my son did the night shift, and I got up at 4.30 and took over the, the day shift. Mm -hmm. We just keep going at it 24-7 until it's over. We'll beat this. Across more than 250 kilometres of river, there are countless more stories of defiance, but also surrender. And you can see why exhausted homeowners might finally give up. These are before and after photos from along the river. Testaments to the sheer volume of water, swallowing up yards, streets, even entire blocks. In the city of Ottawa alone, more than one million sandbags have been filled so far. Now, rising waters are the most obvious threat, but danger also lurks in what that water may carry. Olivia Stefanovic shows us how contamination just adds to the burden. The road leading to Karen Schiller's home is too dangerous to walk down. I can't get in on that road, right? Schiller left yesterday after officials advised that staying was unsafe. I mean, it's got to be at the windows by it's now. Got window it's got to be at the windows by okay. now. But it's not just water she's concerned about. The raw sewage is disgusting. <laughs> That's right, her basement is filled with untreated sewage. Yes, the stench is quite something. Overflowing from septic systems around this entire rural area. We say that that water is black water. In other words, it is not safe. So dangerous, everything it touches needs to be disinfected. First responders bring their gear to hazmat stations like this one at the end of every shift. If we don't clean them, we, uh, they're, they're done. It's just not worth uh, someone getting sick or an infection uh, based on what might be on these. The bacteria is making its way into people's drinking water too. The biggest issue is uh, wells. A lot of uh, both deep and shallow wells uh, um, uh, totally flooded. Evacuees can take a bathroom break at emergency centers, a clean shower, and stock up on bottled water. Some of that supply is making its way through the road closure. Much needed relief for those still on the front lines. More than 300 households in this neighborhood are being asked to clear out. And honestly, I think we've learned our lesson living in a floodplain. Schiller is not sure what's left, but she's going back to salvage personal belongings. It's memories. Honestly, I look around the house and everybody that's been important in my life is there. Then she'll wait for the water to recede. Officials say as much as 25 millimeters of rain will fall by tomorrow morning. And they warn that in a few weeks from now, melting snow from further north will bring more flooding. Olivia Stefanovic, CBC News, Ottawa. Further west in Ontario, more people are dealing with the deluge. Sandbags are in big demand in cottage country. People there forbidden from boating on lakes and waterways. And parts of Quebec continue to cope with streets now paved with water. But floodwaters are receding in New Brunswick. Now the big menace there is mold. Officials say preserving your home just means acting fast. Drying it out as quickly as possible is key to preventing further you know, mold and other damage that can ensue. We're getting into the warmer temperatures now. That will create mold a, a lot faster. And if it's in a cold, wet, you know, damp area, that's going to make it a, a challenge for a further damage down the road. As volunteers scramble to help people uh, so with this next phase, they can take some comfort in that the province has learned from previous crises. 
which is why tonight we will take you to Darlings Island. It sits in a river in southern New Brunswick. About 400 homes are on the island, and the people who live there are used to being cut off by floods. This time around, though, the hardship isn't nearly so severe. Kayla Hounsell shows us why. Right down, right down the middle. There you go. These kids are on their way home from school. The only way is by boat. The only road to their community is underwater for a second year. Last year, residents were left to find their own way home. Some got help from a community volunteer who became known as Uber Rob. But this year, they say things are easier. Three government boats have been here since the road was closed more than a week ago. They were here right away and we didn't have to wait. No one was worried, well, what are we going to do? I'm anxious to get back. There are life jackets, even a bale of hay spread so people don't have to walk through the mud. This is awesome. Actually, I've been out a few times. There's no wait. I've never had to wait. Other things are different too. Now a staging area. Last year, there was a home here. In fact, these homes are gone too. One destroyed, the other moved to a new location. It was one of those things that, um, that was the best to do in everyone's interest. When we met Paul Thompson last May, his home was surrounded by water. This year, he's living on higher ground in neighboring Quispam Sis. There's no water in sight. The provincial government bought his home and sold it to the highest bidder for $5,000. It was heartbreaking. It was heartbreaking because something that you look forward to and you work and said, this is how I want it, and this is going to be our retirement home, and where we want to spend our good times, sitting on the deck and, and watching the ducks play. Now that the homes most vulnerable to flooding have been removed, the issue on Darlings Island is access. The reason Thompson's home was moved was to make way for a new, higher road. And then now we can finally have a road that we can rely on this time of year, which is super important. In the meantime, they're grateful for the boat ride home. Great on, thanks, guys. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, Darlings Island, New Brunswick. Okay, Ian, you're now following a landmark, a controversial ruling by the international sports highest court. That's right, Adrian. The Court of Arbitration for Sport approved a limit on the level of testosterone a female track athlete is allowed to have to run in some races, including at the Olympics. The case was an appeal by South African Castor Semenya, a 28-year-old two-time Olympic gold medal winner. She dominates in the 800 meters, but her biology has put those wins under the microscope. Semenya has a naturally higher testosterone level than most women, a big problem according to the International Association of Athletics Federation. It's magic number, five nanomoles per liter of blood. Normal for a woman is between 0 0.06 and 1.68. For men, it's between 7.7 and 29.4. It is Semenya now taking the lead, looking fresh and powerful. Semenya's level is in public, but the races the IAAF targeted are the ones she runs, the 400, 800, and 1500 meter events. So the options now, take hormone suppressants like birth control and deal with possible side effects, or don't run those races. The CBC's Castrusi has more now on today's ruling and the reaction to it. Semenya just still holds the inside line. This is what it looks like racing against Castor Semenya. Semenya running for gold now in front Today, though, her fight isn't on the track. Semenya is believed to be an intersex woman. It's unclear exactly what her sexual characteristics are. What is clear is that her body naturally produces higher levels of the hormone testosterone, which promotes stronger bones and muscles. An unfair advantage, according to Track and Field's world governing body. It wants to force Semenya and other female athletes to undergo hormone treatment to suppress their testosterone. Today, the Court of Arbitration for Sport, or CAS, said it found the proposed testosterone rules discriminatory, but necessary, reasonable means in preserving the integrity of female athletics. In a statement, the track star said she was disappointed by today's ruling, saying, I know the IAAF's regulations have always targeted me specifically. Basically, what Castor is being told is that she's not woman enough. 
This former Canadian race walker says forcing Semenya and other female athletes to manipulate their hormones is unethical. We know it's harmful to women. That's why hormone replacement ther therapy is no longer the usual response to menopause in women. International sport, you know, has a, uh, a sordid and reprehensible history um, in trying to impose their def definitions of what it means to be female. Others say the court made the right decision. I think it's about time that Cass looked after the majority and thought about how we're going to protect female sport. For now, Caster Semenya has her mind fixed on the weekend for a world championship track meet in Doha. It's the last track meet before the new testosterone rules come into play. Cass Rusi, CBC News, Toronto. That rule change will happen one week from today, and the IAAF has given athletes until then to lower their testosterone levels if they want to compete in the September World Championship. But Semenya has another option. She could change events entirely. Last month, she won gold in the 5,000 meters at the South African Championships. That race not covered by the new testosterone rules. All right, let's have a look now at the ever worsening political crisis in Venezuela and the dangerous tug of war between the two men calling themselves president. Opposition leader Juan Guaido, undeterred by yesterday's military crackdown, called for a general strike today. The point to keep pressuring President Nicolas Maduro to leave office. But not everyone in the capital is with Guaido. This man, part of a large pro-Maduro demonstration across town, he believes Guaido is just part of an American plot to overthrow an elected government. And the effects of the crisis are no longer confined to Venezuela's borders. As Evan Dyer outlines, this battle threatens to become yet another source of tension between two world powers. After a night of violence, nothing has really changed. Nicolas Maduro still in charge, Juan Guaido still free, and the Trump administration still making threats. Military action is possible. If that's what's required, that's what the United States will do. Yesterday, Pompeo claimed, without offering evidence, that Maduro had been on the verge of fleeing to Cuba when the Russians talked him out of it. He warned Russia to stop meddling in the Americas. Not true, says Moscow, which says it's the U.S. that has a puppet in Venezuela, Juan Guaido. Today, the mind games continued. The U.S. accuses three of President Maduro's closest collaborators of reneging on a secret deal to switch sides, including Venezuela's top soldier. If you're Nicolas Maduro, can you look at your defense minister anymore and trust him? I don't think so. I think Maduro is now surrounded by scorpions in a bottle, and it's only a matter of time. We've done a, uh, exhaustive planning, so there's not a situation or a scenario that we don't have a contingency for. But there have been none of the real preparations the U.S. makes for wars it actually plans to fight. No fleets being loaded, no leaves cancelled. And remember that handwritten note John Bolton once showed accidentally on purpose? 5,000 troops to Colombia? Well, they never did deploy. But the war talk has helped Nicolas Maduro to militarize the conflict, arming his party militia and supporters to resist the Yankee invader, though the opposition fears those guns may be turned on them. The more that America threatens military force, the more that the military kind of close ranks uh, around the president. So as soon as the United States stops talking about a military intervention, the sooner we'll get to a, a return to democracy in Venezuela. The U.S. and Canada don't agree on the use of American military force, but U.S. threats may have served one purpose Canada does agree with. They may be the reason the Maduro government hasn't arrested the man it accuses of trying to stage a coup. Evan Dyer, CBC News, Ottawa. One last note on the story tonight. Global Affairs Canada is still advising Canadians to avoid all travel to Venezuela due to political instability and the potential, obviously, for violence. U.S. Attorney General Bill Barr faced some tough questions today from the Senate Judiciary Committee about Robert Mueller's report on Russian meddling in the 2016 election. While the special counsel's report focused on whether the Trump campaign was involved, much of today's testimony revealed the tension between Mueller and Barr himself. Paul Hunter explains. You do solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give this committee is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, except you got it. Yes. 
facing questions on why he chose not to indict Donald Trump on obstruction of justice, the U.S. Attorney General was today firm. You feel good about your decision? Absolutely. Said Bill Barr, he saw no corrupt intent from Trump to obstruct special counsel Robert Mueller's investigation into Russian meddling in the 2016 election. Mueller effectively cleared the Trump campaign of conspiring with Russia, but left it for Barr to decide whether Trump tried to block that investigation. Short answer. I think that the government did not have a prosecutable case. Mueller's report has been out for a while now, but this week a two-page letter emerged written by Mueller last month challenging Barr's four-page summary of Mueller's findings. It's renewed Democratic allegations Barr is covering up for Trump. Being Attorney General of the United States is a sacred trust. You have betrayed that trust. America deserves better. You should resign. But Barr dismissed Mueller's complaint. Uh, you know, it, the letter's a bit snitty, and I think it was probably written by one of his staff people. I called Bob and said, but, you know, what's the issue here? Are you and I asked him if he was suggesting that the March 24th letter was inaccurate, and he said no, but that the press reporting had been inaccurate. Besides, suggested Barr, it's all kind of moot anyway. How can Trump obstruct an investigation when, as Mueller found, there was no conspiracy with Russia to begin with? And we now know that he was being falsely accused. Barr was supposed to face more questions tomorrow from lawmakers led by Democrats in the House of Representatives. Tonight, with word that session would now also include questioning from lawyers, Barr pulled out. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. Here are some of the other stories we're following tonight on The National, including the ongoing dispute between Alberta and British Columbia over oil and gas. British Columbians are currently facing a gasoline crisis, paying a ridiculous buck 70 for a liter uh, in Metro Vancouver. Alberta's new premier today making a case directly to British Columbians over gas prices. Last night, Jason Kenney proclaimed into law the turn off the taps legislation, which, if enacted, would limit gas supply to B.C. The move is in response to the British Columbia government blocking progress on the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion. The lawyers today filed two actions in court to strike down the bill because we believe it's unconstitutional. B.C. didn't waste any time lodging a legal challenge. The Premier says the pipeline expansion would not improve gas prices in Vancouver. Horgan says the project would increase the flow of crude oil, not consumer-ready refined gas. And Beijing has banned Canadian pork from two Quebec producers. A Ministry of Agriculture spokesperson believes China has issues with the paperwork. This is just the latest trade headache between the two countries. Still ahead on The National, the New Yorker who can officially say he lives on Sesame Street, lucky duck. <laughs> Plus taking a long, winding road trip in an electric car, David Common goes for a drive. And the new allergen on the block and why it might show up where you least expect it. So we were making the pizza and Vanessa was eating a piece of pepperoni and then putting one on the pizza and suddenly her face swelled up. A scary moment that this family isn't alone in experiencing. Next. More than two and a half million Canadians live with food allergies. Some of them so severe, even the tiniest exposure can trigger a reaction. So for many, that means poring over labels and constantly questioning what's in their food. That is why there is concern over a new type of protein. It's an alternative to meat that's showing up in more of our meals. But as Vicodopia explains, people with allergies may not even know it's there. Vanessa, do you want to shred the cheese? Like most parents of a child with severe allergies, Mary Campagna is careful to avoid peanuts, so meals are often made at home together. Vanessa was eating a piece of pepperoni and then putting one on the pizza, and suddenly her face swelled up. So we didn't know at the time what it was. Vanessa does get mild allergic reactions to beans, peas, and other legumes, all cousins of the peanut, but nothing like this. I thought it was peanuts. But you didn't eat any peanuts, so... No, I didn't, so I was confused. 
It turns out the pepperoni contained pea protein. Our allergist, she did warn me about reading labels and um, especially for baked goods. But again, I never thought to look at a, a meat product. Indeed, pea protein is popular in vegan food like almond milk or dairy-free yogurt, but it's also used with meat as filler in deli slices and chicken fingers, making it the next big food additive because it's nutritious, cheap and sustainable to grow. Roquette is building in Canada. A French company wants to build the world's largest processing plant in Manitoba. There's already one next door in Saskatchewan, just built by James Cameron. Yes, that one. Collectively, globally, we've got to eat a lot less meat and consume a lot less dairy. But all that pea protein might have some unintended consequences. Pea protein had never been highlighted in my training. This pediatric allergist wrote a paper about it after some of her young patients experienced anaphylactic shock, which can be deadly. Most at risk are a subgroup of people with peanut allergies. Pea protein is a bit of a hack, so it concentrates the protein from a large number of peas into a small amount of pea protein and thereby may be able to elicit much more severe reactions than eating plain green peas. Foods containing pea protein are not labeled as an allergen like nuts are. It's still early days to know how much of a concern it'll be for people with food allergies. I feel like this is something that will come to light with more awareness. Unfortunately for Vanessa and her mom, it's just another thing to worry about. Vicodopia, CBC News, Vaughan, Ontario. Next on The National, when it comes to food allergies, there's just a lot to consider. For instance, when do you introduce food to babies? Is there any way to make reactions less serious? Can you get over an allergy? Andrew and the Health Panel tackle those big questions and more right after this. Hello, we are back with our panel of doctors here. Hello to all of you uh, to talk about allergies. So not, not the seasonal kind, but food allergies specifically, especially given the piece that we just saw just before uh, the commercial break about how pea protein, so the kind of stuff that you'd find in chickpeas, for example, can sometimes cause very serious, adverse, uh, even anaphylactic reactions in a small subset of people. So let's introduce you to the panel. Dr. Zainab Abdurrahman is a pediatric allergist, also an assistant clinical professor at McMaster University. Dr. Lennox Huang is a pediatrician and chief medical officer at the Hospital for Sick Children. And Dr. Samir Sinha is a geriatrician and director of geriatrics at Sinai Health System and the University Health Network in Toronto. So, uh, Zainab, maybe I'll start with you because I, I think a lot of people will have watched that piece and be thinking to themselves, like, my gosh, you got to be kidding me. Food allergy seems to be a problem that's, that's getting worse and worse and worse? All of the allergic diseases are increasing. We're actually seeing an increase in inflammatory disease too. Um, there seems to be a change where we're getting increase in certain types of disease, autoimmune disease, allergic disease, asthma, all of these are increasing. With that, you know, you think, is this a new allergen? It's new to us in North America, but this um, bean is actually used a lot in Europe, so they had seen more allergy to it. So it's a new culprit, right. um, but it falls into a family. And on the, the million dollar question of, of why we are seeing an increase <laughs> in prevalence of allergies, I mean, is, is there a, a clean answer? I don't think there's a clean answer at this point. And you know, we've looked at all sorts of different things, including what we tell families and uh, young, young parents uh, what to feed their children at a very, very early stage. Now, there may be a few clues in that. There may be a few clues in just how we're keeping our environment to, over the past cleanliness, right? like couple hygiene, of decades. Sort of cleanliness, yeah. hygiene, where they're yeah. you know, picking up every single bit of dirt and eliminating all sorts of uh, items from our environment may have an effect that's actually counterproductive. I guess over time, though, we are becoming much more allergy literate, right? Because I, so, right. so I don't mind revealing that I, I have severe food allergies, and, and mm -hmm. it was much worse when I was a kid. Uh, I was allergic to, you know, most fruits, vegetables, a lot of meats, uh, all nuts, seafood, shellfish. Mm -hmm. Like, there was a lot I couldn't eat. Um, it's, it's gotten better over time. But back then, it, it was this weird aberration, right? And it was hard to explain to people what that meant. Today, it's, it's, it's everywhere. I mean, do you, do you see that kind of knowledge reflected in ER visits? I mean, at, at sick No, you know, so, so uh, what we know is that across North America, the visits for some of the most severe forms of uh, food allergy presentations, so things that we would call anaphylaxis, it's up about 100% over the past uh, decade and a half. Yeah. 
And that's not something that just pops up because people are more aware of it. That's something that's very real. So we know that the, the, the incidence, so the, the number of cases of food allergy, it's going up. It's not just being aware of it. Samir, we, we often think of food allergies in particular as being an issue with, with kids. I mean, yeah. that, that's what dominates the conversation. What do we need to know about how seniors interact with food allergies? Yeah, a few things. Like we, we tend to pick up allergies or we tend to learn about allergies in the first three decades of life, yeah. right? And then people, and then there's some allergies where people might outlive them or out, outgrow them, if you will, over time. But one thing we have to remember is that older adults, you know, you don't necessarily lose those allergies. And even older adults can develop allergies too. Huh. And that can be because your immune system changes as you age. Um, also just kind of, you know, different changes in your body. And we often find we underdiagnose allergies in yeah. older adults. Um, and, uh, and sometimes we miss them um, and we don't know how to actually appropriately treat them. Are there older people who, who have gone through their entire lives being undiagnosed to something that they were allergic to all along? Probably. I have a lot of older adults who will have, you know, um, you know, skin reactions or other things. And, and because we're not sure kind of is this aging, is this whatever, I find that I find a lot of people who may have new symptoms and be going underdiagnosed. But the key thing is um, you know, people will be undiagnosed throughout their lifespan. Um, and it's something that we have to be vigilant at all ages because there are things we can do to improve those symptoms and, uh, and sometimes even treat them as well. Well, okay, so let's talk about improving the symptoms then. One question that I think repeatedly comes up is, is to what extent we can turn the clock back on an allergy, right? And, and over the, the years, I mean, we've seen all kinds of studies about, you know, like microdosing with peanuts and, and whether that can help reverse the allergy. I mean, wh where's the science at on that? So, I mean, in terms of food allergy, the first thing would be prevention. The other things that are new that are coming out aren't curing the food allergy. We're just looking at ways to reduce the risk. So things right. like microdosing, people will go through um, a process. It's still considered um, experimental. It's not the standard of care at this time. But you go through a process where you'll get desensitized to a certain amount. So for peanut, maybe to eat one to two peanuts per day, you have to do this consistently. Um, Over a long period of time. Currently, there's no end date for that. You right. would continue that on a daily basis. So if you were accidentally exposed, you could tolerate up to one to two peanuts. Right. Mm -hmm. And so that's it's important, a risk right? Reduction. The, yeah, the, the goal is not to be able to eat peanuts no. like everyone else Ad if you're allergic no. to it. It's, no. it's just if, in case you, you accidentally do it. Yeah. Exactly. What is the prevailing wisdom when it comes to introducing foods? And, and I'm talking about allergenic foods like mm -hmm. peanuts to very, very young children. So, so we used to say, we need to stage the introduction of foods in a very specific way. You know, I, when I first started training, uh, they even told us one particular color after another particular color of vegetable and never two vegetables or fruits or, um, uh, or foods at the same time. That's all out the door now. Yeah. Uh, so in fact, we encourage earlier exposure to all sorts of foods at a very early stage. I mean, right when solids are yeah. introduced? Exactly. I mean, so four, five, yeah. six, exactly. six months. Exactly. But, but I mean, is it just me, or have the studies kind of been rubber banding back and forth? I mean, you get whiplash if you yeah. followed every development, right? That is very true. And I understand why parents, um, other physicians, primary care physicians are frustrated. If you look at the feeding guidelines, they have taken a turn. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, it's gone a full 180. Initially, we had said, maybe we should hold back. Maybe we should not introduce these allergenic foods till you're older, till you're one, till you're four. And what they found was with the introduction of that, we actually saw an increase in food allergy. And right. so they specifically did a study looking at introductions of food early. And they did it with peanut, which everyone's very familiar with the LEAP study. But they actually did it with other foods too, called the EAT study and other health nut study, where they introduced these early and they found that there is a decrease. Samira, so, so I'm thinking of, you know, as, as people with or without allergies kind of go on through life. And, yeah. I, and I'm especially thinking of your earlier point about how people's immune systems change, yep. right? And so this is a very fluid situation. Yeah. What's your point of view on allergy testing? You know, you, you always have to think about allergies not just being something for children, but I think something through all ages. And so if you're having weird symptoms, you know, feel free to ask your doctor, do, do you think this could be an allergy? Mm -hmm. And can I see an allergist, for example, about them? Because then you can get tested around certain medications, but also certain food groups. And then and there, there are some therapies, especially as you get older, people start using things like antihistamines, decongestants, and, you know, for certain types of, um, you know, more seasonal 
seasonal allergies. And we know that maybe you can tolerate those better as a younger person, but as an older person, some of those antihistamines have been shown to increase your risk of dementia. Mm -hmm. So this is why I encourage that, let's figure out what's actually underlying these symptoms, because if we can treat it appropriately um, through available treatments, then maybe we can avoid some of those other negative effects. Is there a, a, a sort of common list of, of either foods or drugs that, that people do tend to grow out of or that, that they tend to develop? I mean, you, you mentioned a few examples there. Well, I mean, there's some, there's some medications, for example, uh, you know, so for common conditions like high blood pressure, yeah. you know, many older Canadians have high blood pressure and a common medication class is called an ACE inhibitor. But we know that one of the common things that we've all learned about is you might develop a cough. One in 10 people will develop a dry cough, not a life-threatening cough or anything like that. But it's one of those things where allergies and kind of allergic reactions or, or just, you know, how we react to things, again, it can evolve and it can be due to a whole bunch of different things. That's why it's always, if you're developing a new symptom and that you've never had it before, again, talk to your doctor about it, point it out, and don't be afraid to say, could this be an allergy? Right. You know, just to, oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, no, go just for to it. interject with that, the mm -hmm. other thing about being an adult is, if you have something you don't feel, you feel poorly with it, you're like, oh, really, I felt off, as an adult, you might just automatically start avoiding that food. Yes. Um, and But you need to actually sort out, is it something that is actually going to be life-threatening? Do I need to actually carry an epinephrine auto-injector? It's important to sometimes separate that. So I'm really glad you make that point because the, the be-all and end-all of any conversation about allergies is the EpiPen. Right? Mm -hmm. and, and that's right. Dr. Huang, you, you brought... I brought an, an EpiPen. EpiPen. <laughs> right. And so can I just say... Trainer. <laughs> so uh, so I, I've used an EpiPen on myself uh, like a dozen times in my life, maybe even more than that. But the funny thing is every person I know who has one of those things but who hasn't ever had to use it yet, they're, they're terrified. Absolutely. Of the possibility. Well, you know, this is why they have trainers for this. And this is not a real EpiPen, but this is the trainer. So there's not a sharp business point to needle at this end. And uh, we encourage families, parents, anybody who might be in the position of giving epinephrine through via an EpiPen to actually practice it. And you practice it over and over and over again so that when the time comes and you think you might be needing to use this to save a life, you're not going to hesitate and you're actually going to uh, deliver it. We're out of time, but folks, thank you for that uh, an enlightening discussion as always. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Next on the National, Ottawa wants you to drive green, introducing new incentives for consumers looking at electric cars. You say you're down to half a tank of gas now, but since when? Since I bought the vehicle nine months ago. So that's the whoa, gas. Whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah, that's you're the on the same tank of gas from nine months ago. Nice, but are they for everyone? David Common finds out. Montreal police say they've arrested five people this evening during May Day demonstrations. Hundreds of protesters marched downtown. We told, we're told they were demonstrating against low wages and gentrification. Riot police were deployed and officers say there were several acts of vandalism and some damage to property. And in Paris, police fired tear gas during May Day protests. Many of the demonstrators were members of the so-called yellow vests, but dark-clad protesters also wreaked havoc. Dozens of people were injured, almost 400 were arrested. You proud go, of sir, Are you proud of that? Are you proud of that? No, again. I'm telling the truth, you're not. Well, just one highlight of tonight's first televised election debate in Newfoundland and Labrador, the Premier Dwight Ball vying for a second term against two newcomers from the Progressive Conservatives and the NDP. Voters head to the polls on May 16th. NHL Commissioner Gary Bettman was grilled today by a committee of MPs. He had this to say about multiple concussions and the degenerative brain disease known as CTE. Other than some anecdotal evidence, there has not been that uh, conclusive link. Bettman said it would be impossible to ban all hits to the head because it would mean the end of all hitting, something he says fans enjoy. It was hard to pull the trigger, I gotta tell you, because uh, I really very much to enjoy what I do. Uh, I love to ride the horses, I'm still in one piece. 
72-year-old Canadian equestrian Ian Miller speaking with the CBC today after announcing his retirement from international competition. In 1989, he and his horse Big Ben were the first to win back-to-back -back World Cup finals. And in 2012, Miller became the first athlete to compete in 10 Olympic Games. Ottawa wants Canadian drivers to go green and they're offering to help pay for it. Federal rebates kicked in today that will take up to $5,000 off the cost of an electric vehicle and $2,500 off a plug-in hybrid for vehicles up to $55,000. That would include some of the most popular models like the Nissan Leaf, the Chevy Bolt and some versions of the Tesla Model 3. Add that to provincial rebates in places like BC and some drivers will be looking at even bigger savings. So, why isn't everyone rushing out to take advantage of the free money? David Common took a road trip to find out. Probably not a surprise that Canada's electric vehicle mecca is here on Salt Spring Island. The green-leaning community claims to have a greater concentration of zero-emission vehicles than anywhere else in North America. So what made you start doing this with an electric vehicle? the ecological aspect of it and keeping our carbon footprint as small as possible. Jason Griffin, one of hundreds of EV drivers here, but it's not a utopia. Jason needs a van to move tourists around wineries and this is the only electric van for sale right now. This was my only real option um, for a vehicle this size. He uses solar panels to charge his van. But even when full, the electric range is only 50 kilometers. After that, a gas engine kicks in. Jason, though, keeps his tours tight. You say um, you're down to half a tank of gas now, mm -hmm. but since when? Since I bought the vehicle nine months ago. So that's the whoa, gas. Whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah, that's You're the, on the same tank of gas from nine months ago. That's the gas that came from Willie Dodge in Victoria where I bought this, this van. So, yeah. So I guess that shows even, the electrical charge is enough. Yeah. for what you do. Oh yeah, yeah, it's, it's totally fine. For others though, limited range and limited model selection mean many Canadians are intrigued by electric but worry it's not yet the right moment. Doing this story about electric vehicles, even we weren't confident enough to drive 700 kilometers inland in an EV. But as we head up the mountains through snow and wilderness towards the isolated town of Rossland, we're meeting someone whose job it is to bust myths and assuage the worries. So have you driven? No. no? no. Okay. Have no. you got much information no. before? You're brand new. Yes. Yes. That's great. Jen, David. Hey, David. Nice to meet Good you. Good to meet you. Yeah. So how's it going? It's TV awesome. TV show's on. It's on. Jen yeah, Grebeldinger so is showing off electric vehicles, trying to dispel yeah. myths in the rural interior where conditions can get bad quickly. When we're in a rural environment like this, what is the biggest inhibitor for people considering the leap into an EV? Uh, so across BC, what we always hear is selection, availability at dealerships, local mm -hmm. dealerships, and then cost. To challenge misconceptions, Jen is offering test drives. Sure. So we hop in too. When you're out there talking about electric vehicles, what are the things people go, yeah, but? Um, yeah, but, but winter. Winter. Yeah, but hills. Hills. And what uh, do you say to those? Just drive safely with winter tires, and that's your winter driving for most people, right? You seem to like it. I like it, yeah. There are a lot of surprised looks here, and that's the point of this EV showcase, to have existing EV owners explain just how they manage. Do you have kids? Yeah, it's two and boys. And everybody gets in there? There is a map of the Kootenai Charge infrastructure over here. Okay. So that's actually a lot more than I would have thought. Okay, so a fair bet. And there's still the front motors in here. And then there's your fluid there. Your okay. fluid. We are seven hours from Calgary, seven hours from Vancouver. Why an electric vehicle? The principle, basically. My requirements were a 500 kilometer electric range and all wheel drive for the mountains in the winter. And how many vehicles did that leave you to choose from? This is the only one. Actual selection is still quite limited, but it is changing. More cars, larger cars, soon pickups. Pull it back into drive there. So cars still on, obviously. Uh, so how do you know it's running? The screens are on. <laughs> and gradually, more with ranges above 300 kilometers. Oh, she's responsive, eh?
In the passenger seat, a farmer from Saskatchewan. The electric tractors are coming out too. Yeah, Thomas tractors, yeah, they'll be coming. Not sure how all that's going to work. His son-in-law, though, thinks it could work into his lifestyle. What'd you think? Oh, it's awesome. We get so used to being able to do whatever we want, whenever we want to do. We get hungry, we just stop whenever, and we don't have to plan anything out. But with a little bit of pre-planning, you, you could make this work. That is the hope of the EV showcase. Get people thinking less about the barriers, more about overcoming them. Indeed, for EV owners, most, if not all, charging happens at home, and it's cheap, two or three bucks for a full charge. Not everyone will be convinced, but just seeing electric vehicles in action is enough for many to take a second look. So Jen is continuing her no emission road trip, traveling and charging, showing others what's already possible. David Common, CBC News, Rossland, BC. Next on The National, our moment, an age-old question finally answered. Can you tell me how to get our well, yes, we can. A special announcement to celebrate 50 years of the street. We finally know where it is. Next, the man who woke up finding out he is Big Bird's newest neighbor. But first. In case you missed it, everybody needs an occasional boost in these stressful times, which is why Dante Colley is the new best friend you never knew you needed. The Instagram star cranks out so many BTUs of sheer unbridled positivity, he could be harnessed as a power source. Kali takes whatever piece of music he's into at the moment, cooks up a dance number around it, and then, using Adobe Effects, basically love bombs you with motivational messages and encouragement, all from this home in Toronto's East End. His unapologetically joyous, even a bit ridiculous, videos have already earned him 670,000 followers and counting. Today gonna be a good day. Including Beyonce. And his self-taught dance moves have also won him gigs with Rihanna, Will Smith, and Ariana Grande. Having lost his father, stepbrother, and grandfather at a young age, and then his sister to suicide just four years ago, Kali says he understands depression all too well and just wants to be a source of positivity for those fighting it. Bringing more awareness to like mental health and how important it is to deal with the most vital organ of our body, our mind. You go, Dante. Your inbox needs more Canada. Get a weekly collection of fascinating stories, fun facts, and intriguing trivia with the CBC Newsletter. Subscribe now and get the best of Canada. You may have wondered at some point in your life, how do you get to Sesame Street? Well, 50 years later, we now have an answer. Today, New York City made it official renaming West 63rd and Broadway, Sesame Street. That's where the show's workshop is located. And it's also home to a New Yorker. And the moment he discovered his new neighbors is our moment. Can you tell me how to get our to Sesame Street? I hear the Sesame Street theme song and crowds cheering. <laughs> I'm like, what is going on? I grabbed my camera and I ran downstairs and I went outside. And then sure enough, they were announcing it's the 50th anniversary of Sesame Street and they're changing the name of our street. It's a Sesame Street. They were all super friendly and they were, you know, um, just loving what was happening. And, um, and I'm like, yeah, I live right there. We're neighbors, you know. I met the Cookie Monster, Ernie. I met uh, five or six of the characters. It's so cool because it's always been a fictitious street. And it almost, it does actually feel like I am their neighbor. And there's certain things that happen in New York that don't happen anywhere else, you know. And now Sesame Street's based in New York. And it's like, I really did love Sesame Street growing up. So it kind of felt like a sign to me that I'm on the right path. Can you tell me how to get our dance in Sesame Street? 63rd on Broadway. Can you tell me how to get our Okay, fun fact about John, his landlord wanted an answer from him today. Look, are you renewing the lease or what's going on with you? And he said uh, he was thinking about it, but of course, 
now that it's Sesame Street, of course he's renewing his lease, he told us. And in terms of that perennial, at least for people our age, uh, question, how do you get to Sesame Street? You, you, you looked it up. Oh, of course. <laughs> yeah, I did. Uh, the Guardian was very helpful about this. Apparently, if you're in New York, write this down. You take the one uptown to 66th and Lincoln yep. Center. Are you, are you writing it? You I am, walk yeah. three blocks down to 63rd. You take a left on Broadway. If you hit Central Park, you have gone too far. Excellent. Uh, maybe this will start a trend. Uh, an edgy <laughs> choice for another street could be uh, Avenue Q, somewhere in Manhattan. Not bad. And in Toronto, and only some people will understand this reference, we should have a butternut square which was the okay. show that Mr. Dressup was on before Mr. Dressup. Anyway, okay. that is The National for Wednesday, <laughs> May the 1st. Good, Good night. night. I did not know that. <laughs>